So hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Today, we welcome you to a CE3C in Contrasciencia. The talk will be recorded, so I ask anyone who does not want to appear the, to keep the video turned off. This video will later be available on CE3C YouTube channels. We are quite pleased to have today as our speaker, Professor uh, Samuel Yers. I am not sure if I will pronounce it correctly, uh, Yemen. Um, not not correct. No, How it, no but I, I normally I ask people just at the beginning the name or be sure that I say it correctly. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, you can leave questions during the talk through the chat or at the end you can ask directly. Um, Samuel will be presented by Sir Vitor Sosa, to whom I now give the floor. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you, <clears throat> Patricia. It's my great pleasure to welcome uh, Sam here at University of Lisbon. Uh, so Sam um, did a PhD at the University of British Columbia uh, with Michael Whitlock, which is a very um, famous uh, evolutionary biologist, and he has done lots of important and relevant work understanding how populations can adapt when there is gene flow. He then did a postdoc in Switzerland in uh, uh, sorry, Neuchâtel, right? In Neuchâtel with uh, Professor uh, Laurent Levin. Uh, and there he also did some interesting work on evolution of culture, right? And cultural evolution and how, uh, and if and how uh, culture uh, evolves. Then he went back to British Columbia to do another postdoc, in that case, I think with Saliotto, who is also a very famous. Um, evolutionary biologist and theoretical uh, evolutionary biologist. And then he became uh, a professor at the University of Calgary uh, in 2016 uh, or yeah, 15. Yeah, uh, okay, I <laughs> sorry, I don't have here my notes as you can see. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so it's our great pleasure to have um, Sam here today and I'm very looking forward for your talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hubert. Uh, it's nice to be here to network to all of you, and uh, yeah, just, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, some of the stuff that's going on now in my lab, more on the empirical side of things than some of the theory, um, uh, but really looking at, at uh, these questions of constraint in adaptation and what, what we mean by constraint and whether adaptation is flexible uh, or, or kind of stuck to go down particular pathways. Um, and so I'll start it off with uh, with a question. Um, you know, what what determines the capacity of adaptive evolution? I think it's a really broad question. Uh, there's many many different factors that affect this. And and what I'm going to be thinking about it is, you know, our understanding of this may have been from uh, Fisher's fundamental theorem. We might say that adaptive potential is is related to genetic variation. And I think that's certainly a, a simple and, and appropriate and important explanation but then now in the genomic area era we want to understand uh, a little more nuance to that and what does that actually mean and, and how does constraint come into play uh, when adaptations happen and so in, in the genomic area if you're familiar with with human research for example uh, these genome-wide association studies have been done where we're looking for correlates of, of uh, trait variation so looking, trying to find, identify causal SNPs or causal polymorphisms driving uh, trait variation. And you can see here uh, the discovery sample size, so how big the, the, the study was on the x-axis, and then the number of hits they found on the y-axis. And you can also kind of imagine the newer studies are up here and the older studies are down here. Uh, what the, the pattern that kind of emerges is that the more you look, the more you find, uh, implying there's tons and tons of stuff out there that actually has a causal effect on phenotypic variation. And, and the inference you might make from this is that there's abundant evolutionary potential. Um, many different ways to evolve a useful phenotype because there's so much genetic variation. But uh, my, my gut feeling is that this is actually not the case. I think that probably we take this univariate approach to thinking about evolution where we're looking at just say one trait, like uh, either body mass or height, uh, we look at, there a pointer like the old school pointer okay oh good <laughs> I love these. wonderful so uh, we may have you know body mass index or height these are these univariate traits and uh when fisher was talking about variation he was talking about genetic variation for fitness 
not actually variation for traits. And traits have all sorts of pleiotropic effects. They have all sorts of correlated negative stuff. And I, I'd suggest that probably most of the GWAS stuff is fundamentally deleterious, has some effect on a, on a character, but really doesn't, it's not gonna contribute to adaptation in the long term. And I, I think my intuition for that comes from uh, studies like this, where we see, when we look out at, at, at different plants, so the maize and sunflower and Arabidopsis, all using flowering time to evolve in response to uh, changes in, in photo period. And so, uh, you know, when we actually look at genes that do stuff in plants or in animals, we see much more constraint than implied by these kind of GWAS methods where we say, oh, thousands of loci are, are affecting trait variation. That may be the case, but when we actually see adaptation working, it tends to work on a much smaller scale. So in, in animals, people are familiar often with MC1R, driving pigmentation variation in all sorts of different vertebrates. Uh, and, and the question can kind of come up, well, why these genes? Why are we seeing large effect loci over and over again? Um, in, in vertebrates, we can see, this is a list compiled by Hopi Hoekstra that just shows all these different genes that are known to affect mouse coat color uh, pigmentation in mice. So there's many, many different ways you can change the color phenotype. But uh, over and over again, when people look, I mean, there's a goody, there's a few other genes that are also involved, but uh, this MC1R gene in, in pink here is one that tends to be found over and over again, driving adaptation. And that suggests there's something either special about MC1R or non-special about all the other genes, depending on which way you like to think of it. Uh, and, and so I think, you know, you might call that, there's a lot of potential from MC1R, you might call it, there's a lot of constraint affecting the other loci, um, two sides of the same coin, I'd say. But what I'm interested in is, is why is this, why do we see these kinds of patterns happening? And I think it, it could come from two very different world views about how evolution works. Uh, it could be that there's a limited number of ways to make the same thing, right? There's, there's just not many, developmental program ways you can actually make a given phenotype, or it could be there's lots of ways to make the same thing, the same phenotype, but only a few of them are good. Well, only a few of them lack pleiotropic negative consequences, that there's something special about some of them. And I think um, it's kind of like a developmental constraints versus a selective constraints worldview of why this kind of repeatability might happen. And I think generally, I'm really interested in, in, in the subtle kind of variations that might lead to one or the other of these kinds of questions. So I, I think big questions in trying to understand adaptations, is, you know, what is the nature of potential, adaptive potential? Um, is evolution actually flexible as, as this kind of GWAS data implies and, and why or why not? Um, those are much bigger than I you know, hope to tackle in my lifetime. So smaller bite-sized questions that I'll try to get at a little bit in this talk. Um, is just, you know, what is the basis of adaptation? Before we even understand why, we need to actually understand what, you know, what, what mutations are driving this. Um, how extensive is repeatability? You know, we have these examples like MC1R and flowering time. Um, are those the kind of the nature papers that we're all aware of, uh, but really most reality is way more complicated than that? Or is, are, is it common that we find large effect loci like this? Um, how do we interpret repeatability? And then, you know, some theoretical predictions, like what is, what can we conclude from repeatability when we see it? So uh, various projects in my lab have worked on different aspects of this stuff. And I'll talk mostly today about um, the top one of these, just trying to find the genetic basis of adaptation and quantify uh, repeatability in uh, species. But first I'll, I'll just go over a few uh, predictions about uh, repeatability from some, some work that we've done in, in my lab on theory stuff, just to kind of situate where I'm coming at this from theoretically, and then uh, go into some empirical studies of repeatability of local adaptation, and then some work we've done recently on stickle bias. So um, Haldane and, and also Wright uh, back in early days showed that when you have migration selection balance, so when you've got local adaptation, divergent, selection and then some mixing back and forth between populations. Uh, large effect alleles will tend to predominate, we think, because uh, they tend to have a strong strength of selection relative to a given migration. So there's a, a given migration rate between two populations, they're adapting to their local environment, then small effect alleles will not tend to have large, large enough selection coefficients to get over the migration swamping threshold, whereas large effect alleles will have that potential. And so, 
we may make a general prediction that we will see more large effect loci when migration rates are high. And so we may affect, expect there's some kind of repeatability ingredients to that as well. You know, if only certain loci are actually able to make large effect alleles, then we might see more repeatability just because migration is kind of going on in this background to adaptation. So the one, one kind of flavor that, that where we may see an interaction between ecology and repeatability comes through this. Another way you can get large effect loci from the perspective of the genome is if you cluster multiple mutations together in tight linkage. So if you have small mutations that are linked together and essentially never recombine, then they can act from the perspective of selection as if there were one larger locus and they can get over that migration boundary by this. So you can have a, a concentrated architecture where there's many different, or clustered architecture where there's many different alleles uh, in tight linkage together. And so um, some theory work that I've done and that's reviewed in a, a recent paper uh, is just kind of showing how under migration selection balance, when migration rates are low, you tend to see, or, or, or high, sorry, you tend to see genetic architectures evolving over time where from, you know, the, the time is on the x-axis here. And the, this is just that looking across the chromosome and we're seeing which uh, loci are contributing to adaptation here. You can see that at the beginning, loci all across the chromosome are contributing, but by the end, everything is clustered together into one area. So there's this highly concentrated area that's contributing to adaptation. Whereas when migration is low, you'll tend to see more randomly distributed loci throughout the genome. And uh, you know, that, that, that can be a kind of a stable or diffuse uh, architecture. So we, get, we have this kind of expectation that genetic architecture may differ depending on migration rates. But then you can also have a kind of a third kind of genetic architecture where um, phenotypic divergence evolves between, uh, between populations that are adapting to different environments, but um, there's no underlying signal in the genome. Basically, if there's enough variation present, different mutations will, or different alleles will contribute to divergence uh, transiently for short amounts of time as selection kind of pulls apart the phenotypes and then migration homogenizes them. And so you can maintain phenotypic divergence with no underlying uh, allelic divergence. And I think, I hope you, hopefully you can see clearly that if you look for repeatability of adaptation over a temporal time scale, you, know, you can see no repeatability of adaptation from one moment to the next over deep time. And so that could also be the case over space. If you looked at multiple transects across space, and this kind of thing was happening, you wouldn't expect to see much repeatability. Whereas if either of these kinds of things were happening, you would expect to see high repeatability. So some of the work I've done that I won't go into too much here gets into the nuances of this, but I'd just like to keep it in mind that um, this is the stuff that's easily detectable and will be highly repeatable. This is the stuff that's very non-repeatable and basically non-detectable. There's probably some, combination of this stuff in reality. And we don't know how much of each scenario really exists. And so for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna be mostly talking about this stuff uh, with the, the big uh, elephant in the room being that probably a huge amount of interesting stuff is here and we know nothing about it. So I just wanna, I, I like to set that up because we, we can only really get it at the accessible stuff that has large effects because that's what we can detect. And that tends to be repeatable because that's what's actually statistically easy to find. But this kind of evolution might be just as prevalent and just as important. So, so take everything else I say in this talk with, the, with that in mind. Um, so on to thinking about empirically. So uh, the, the first talk I want to, or the first project I want to go over is a follow-up to some work we did uh, recently that was published last year um, in conjunction with Lauren Riesberg's lab on sunflowers. Um, we looked at uh, a few different species of sunflowers that were sampled across the range of, of Western United States, mostly a little bit up into Canada. And these are uh, sympatric species that, that, that are parapatric species that overlap in their ranges. They still hybridize a little bit, uh, not a whole, a whole bunch, but there's uh, three main taxa we were focusing on, annuus and pedialaris, which grow across the range, and then argophyllus which is more restricted down to the south. And we were interested, we found a whole bunch of inversions in these species that were reported in this earlier paper that were strongly associated with some phenotypes and environmental uh, regions, uh, kind of environments. 
And what we wanted to follow up on was looking at repeatability of uh, signatures of local adaptation across all these species. So really focusing a little more on not just the inversions, but on genome-wide signals selection. And so the questions I'd like to get at here are, you know, if we see the same regions of the genome contributing to local adaptation, the temperature and climate um, in these different species, uh, what the importance is of inversions. And so whether we know inversions seem to be very strongly important in driving local adaptation, but the inversions are only found in a single species. So do we also see those regions of the genome that harbor an inversion, do they also tend to contribute to adaptation in the species lacking an inversion? Um, and then also thinking about what drives repeatability, what's the importance of the environment, uh, and can we detect that? And so just to give you a brief overview of the methods, we've, we've done all this the, the se this sequencing and SNP calling, found millions of variants across the genome, and then done uh, genome-wide association studies on uh, 71 phenotypic variables and 15 soil and 26 environmental variables. So looking at lots of different components of the natural environment and the phenotype, and trying to find regions in the genome that show strong associations with these phenotypes. Um, we first start by testing for repeated signatures of adaptation. So doing pairwise tests where we find, say, a region in one species that's strongly associated with a given environment, and then test if that region also is strongly associated with the environment in other species. And so when that happens, I'll call it a window of repeated association. So it's a window of the genome that's strongly associated with an environment or a phenotype in at least two species. And then we've also clustered to deal with linkage disequilibrium and, and the fact that, that sometimes lots of neighboring windows in the genome will all be uh, looking the same. We will sometimes do clustering of these together. So when I call them uh, CRAs, that's just clusters of repeated association. So uh, we've done some LD clustering to, to collapse things that are next to each other in the genome, linked genetically and basically behaving much the same. So the first thing we did was to uh, look at adaptation to abiotic stress in sunflower as a, 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 this is a kind of a contrast in what's happening in one species with what's happening in another using phenotype environment correlations. So we can, uh, what I'm showing here is the phenotype environment correlation in species one compared to the phenotype environment correlation in species two. Each point is a contrast between a given phenotype and a given environment. So this one might be, height compared to uh, soil carbon or something like that. And so if there's a really strong negative relationship, that means that you know, like in, in areas that have high soil carbon tend to have very, very low height and vice versa. And so what we're looking at is when we find that there's a strong correlation between phenotype and environment, these are phenotypes measured in a common garden. So we've taken out the local uh, environmental effects, the plasticity effects, um, a strong correlation uh, phen between phenotype and environment is indicative of local adaptation. And seeing the same correlation uh, or a, a seeing a strong correlation in two species suggests that both of those species are having a strong relationship between a given phenotype and the same environment. Right? So if we're seeing you know, points up here have a high positive correlation between phen phenotype and environment in both species, points down here have the opposite. So there's a strong positive in one species and a strong negative in the other. And what we wanna do then is really just uh, pull out the environments that are up here and down here and the phenotype environments that are up, up there and there. Like we wanna consider all the extreme ones as being strongly selective. We don't care about the direction. We're gonna get rid of the directional information and just say either way, positive or negative, if there's a strong association, we wanna record that. And so to do that, we'll use this index where we just take the, the Pearson's R values. So R1 plus R2 times R1 times R2 uh, gives us an index where that index will be very, very high when both correlations are high and will be close to zero when either one or the other correlation is close to zero. And so, yeah, so more uh, a higher in, higher value of this, I'm gonna call it the index. A higher value means those environments, phenotype relationships are more simple. And so what's, what's interesting I, I found was that uh, across, these are six different uh, comparisons between pairs of, of taxa. So there's four taxa, uh, Argophilus, Annuus, Pedialaris, uh, subspecies Pedialaris, and Pedialaris subspecies Phallix. And each of these is a pairwise contrast between those. 
And you can see the CIPEC index between the species is on the x-axis. And then the number of clusters of repeated association is on the y-axis. So the, the number of regions of the genome that show a signature of repeated adaptation is on the y. And we can see that for this, the, the environments that tend to have a really high similarity of driving adaptation between species, we also are finding more regions of the genome that are similar in their association. So it's kind of a, I always find it a bit of a mouthful to talk about this, the so similarity of environments between two species and then more uh, similar regions that are associated with that environment, which is what you'd expect, right? You'd expect that if there's more similarity in a strong phenotype environment association, you see uh, broadly more, um, more, more kind of repeated adaptation signatures. There, there's a lot of noise. Right, so I'm not, I'm not going to say it's, it's uh, not uh, noisy, but it is, uh, it, it, it's there. There's no uh, significance values attached to this because these are all different environments. Each one of these is a different phenotype or, or environment. And uh, the environmental variables are correlated with each other, so they're not independent. And um, it's not fair to you to put a fake uh, p-value on this. Um, the other thing we wanted to do was look at the overlap with inversions. So I'll show you a few plots that look like this, where these are the, um, the proportion of non-repeated windows. So these are windows that seem to have a strong association with environment in one species, but not the other. And then on the y-axis, windows that have a strong association with environment in both species. So we're doing a comparison here between uh, each annulus and each color point is, each color is a different subspecies or different species. And you can see this is the proportion of non WRAs and inversions compared to the proportion of WRAs and inversions. And so, what we're seeing is that um, if, if having a repeated adaptation had no effect on uh, being in an inversion, or being in an inversion had no effect on, on repeated adaptation, you see everything along the one to one line. We see lots of enrichment above that one to one line that's significant. The, the, the grayish points are non significant. And so, we're seeing that. Uh, the repeated regions of adaptation are tending to fall more within inversions than you expect by chance. And that's neat because the inversions are actually still only found in one species. So the inversions are contributing to adaptation, but we're still finding uh, signatures of the same region without the inversion also contributing to adaptation. And we see the same kind of pattern in each of the, these are the four species or subspecies that we're looking at, and then each of them compared to the other subspecies. And you can see we, we rarely find anything in this bottom right quadrant. We're often finding enrichment where the windows of repeated association are falling more often with the versions. Think about that. Um, so I, I think it's neat because it suggests that regions that are uh, with inversions are also driving adaptation in species lacking inversions. Um, and, and we can talk a bit more about why that might be the case. I think it's interesting because it, it, it suggests that you don't need the inversion to have those regions contributing to it to adaptation. Um, inversions are thought to be important for local adaptation because they reduce recombination between uh, alleles that are in the inversion because they suppress recombination and then that allows uh, those alleles to act as if they're a single cluster. So from the perspective of migration selection balance, they can get over that migration swamping limit. Um, and what's neat is that if we're finding the same signatures of adaptation in the species lacking the inversion, it suggests that the inversion helps, but isn't necessary for that uh, region to contribute to adaptation. Um, we also deployed a, a method we recently developed in conjunction with some collaborators called Pikmin to just test for, um, instead of doing pairwise uh, contrast between species, we looked at all four, four species simultaneously. And just said, you know, does this gene, the same gene, looking at it in all four species, does it have an extreme signature of uh, association? What did you expect by chance? We found that uh, the strongest region, the strongest environment was called uh, PREF. It's this Hargreaves evapotranspiration index. It's kind of like a hot, dry versus cool, wet uh, index. And we found uh, 10 regions of the genome that were uh, strongly significant. Uh, or 32 at a weaker FDR correction threshold. Um, and then the strongest phenotype we found was base to flowering, which uh, had uh, four regions of the genome for 18 of that. 
So we're finding some regions of the genome that are seeming to be important in all the species we look at, not just through these pairwise contrasts. And uh, some of them are lighting up for, for interesting genes that we know are important, uh, like flowering time, the one that I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, uh, shows up in one of these windows here. Oh dear. Didn't, uh, I just resaved this as a, as a PDF and this, this didn't apparently save nicely. But um, so I'll, I'll pantomime it. <laughs> uh, the, the, what I think is interesting about this work is you know, we, we're finding detectable signatures of repeated adaptation. We're seeing that you know, the, the genes that are contributing to adaptation are not a random draw from the low side around the <coughs> genome. There's certainly more repeatability than by chance, but not a lot more. And, and what these uh, graphs would have shown you is that the, the most strongly associated locus in each species, you would have seen most of the strong associations with environmental phenotype are non-overlapping, right? So while there is signatures of repeatability, you have seen like a bar there and a bar there and a bar there and a bar there, where most of the genes are actually not repeated at all. And there's a lot of idiosyncratic or species specific signatures. Uh, that seem to be there. And, and you can get a feeling for this. This is a kind of a classical Manhattan plot style of looking at this, where um, we're looking along the chromosome and the, uh, the height along the y-axis is the strength of evidence for a given window of the genome uh, contributing to association. So as we are calling it the top candidate index. Um, it's not worth going into the details of it. But the y-axis says if you're higher on the y-axis, more evidence that that region is important. And you can see here, uh, these are each of the four different uh, taxa we're looking at. And I've highlighted in, in, in cyan, these two regions of the genome here that do have repeated signatures across the species. So you can see there's a peak in both of these two here. There's a peak in the same place uh, for these ones. Uh, there is some obvious repeated adaptation when you look at this, but um, much more of the peaks, the strong signatures are unique to a single species. Right? So if you look through each of the ones I've put stars on are uh, non-repeated signatures. And so I, I don't want to, to, to emphasize, overemphasize the importance of repeated adaptation. It tends to be shiny and exciting. We find it and we're like, oh, we got the strong p-value. But there's all sorts of stuff that's happening. It's idiosyncratic, harder to study. It's harder to prove that this stuff is actually causal because it could be due to drift or due to uh, demographic issues that are much harder to control for. Accurate. But uh, probably, prob like we, we think these are likely important for adaptation, and it's likely that a lot of the adaptation signatures are non uh, repeated across the gene. So I think, I think that the, the conclusion I take from this work is that there's both a, a signature of significant repeatability, uh, but also abundant redundancy. So uh, abundant evidence for lots of different ways of, of dealing with climate, lots of different ways of. of Evolving an adaptive phenotype. You know, I've shown you with the repeated stuff, we do see um, more repeated signatures of association than expected by chance. We're seeing enrichment of these within inversions, which is, uh, I think, really interesting. Um, and we found some known candidate genes that, you know, there's some things that are, are non surprising, like flowering time that show up in these windows of repeated association. But um, I think that the harder to prove, uh, but very obvious when you look at the Manhattan plots is that a lot of evolution is non-repetitive, or is, is non-repetitive, repetitive, and is highly, implies high redundancy. Right? So it suggests that there's lots of different ways of doing the same thing, and that each species has kind of figured out a different way to deal with their environment and, and the, the variation of the country. Uh, I'm gonna quickly go over uh, casting the net that we're doing now a little more broadly in, a, in uh, project in my lab being it was started by Clemo Roger, a postdoc, and, and now continued by Jim Whiting, who's working with me on this. And we've had contributions from about 30 research, 30 or so research groups with different species from uh, conifers to brassicas. So uh, species all across the, the, the plant kingdom, uh, looking only for data sets where there was genome-wide or, or exome capture data. So, so expensive, hard to get sequence data. Um, that, that gives you a really nice signature of what's happening in the genome and looking for cases where there's lots of populations sampled across these environments as well. So basically replicating the same methods in sunflowers, but looking across a much broader uh, number of species. 
And so I'll show a few results now, but these are uh, highly preliminary. We just found a bug in them uh, a week or two ago. So the previous slides have been updated to get rid of the bug, but I definitely don't want to promise that this, what I'm showing you now is, is uh, the final version. We're not changing the methods, but if we find bugs, we're obviously fixing them. Um, so it, just to give you an overview of the kind of what we're doing, same thing, we're calling SNPs on all these data sets, huge amount of sequence data. Uh, each person, like each research group that had generated this data had, had you know, applied their own particular pipeline to it and made their own data. And we wanted to get rid of all that uh, heterogeneity. So we recalled all the variants on this using a common bioinformatic pipeline. Um, that took uh, almost two years of uh, really frustrating and not fun uh, data crunching that I didn't have to do. <laughs> um, and then we, uh, the Genotech Environment Associations, same kind of methods as before, and uh, used OrthoFinder to identify orthology between all these sorts of issues. And so uh, I'll just show you the Pikmin results. This is the ones where we're looking gene by gene to say for this gene or this, you know, this set of orthologs, uh, across all the different species, are they uh, more strongly associated with the, the given environment than we expect by chance? Um, we also eventually are going to look at things like pairwise analyses to decouple um, environment and phylogeny and uh, looking at genomic islands, all sorts of different. There's lots of questions that come from having a nice comparative data set like this, but I'll just briefly talk about the first one here. So uh, when we find, uh, we find a bunch of genes that seem to be important, uh, at FDR of less than 10%, we're finding that precipitation in the dry month is the environmental variable most strongly repeated with uh, only six genes are really showing up as being strongly associated with that environmental variable across multiple species. Um, but the FDR we set, uh, as you can see up here, is really strongly drives what we find. If we set a more loose FDR, we get obviously a lot more, um, a lot more genes that are showing up. Um, so we're, we're still kind of chewing on how to actually interpret all that. Um, this is now looking at the different environments in columns and different species in rows and just the number of significant orthogroups that we're finding. So the ones that, how many orthogroups are lighting up as being significant. And there's not, this is just to show you that the results aren't being particularly strongly driven by one species or group of species. We're not seeing a, a bar where everything, you know, everything is being driven by <laughs> Arabidopsis or something. Um, the, the slight darkness you see down here is because the conifer genome sets we have are not um, not as good quality uh, as the data sets. Um, and then here's the genes. These are the ones that are FDR significant at uh, point one, I think. And you can just see that uh, each each uh, column is a gene, each row is a species. And uh, the ones that are dark blue are not being associated in that species. The ones that are light blue are in one uh, climate, and then the ones that are orange or red are in two or three climates. And so you can see there's, there's a bunch of genes that are strongly associated in uh, many species, at least. Uh, and that was pretty neat to see. Um, so these are cool. Uh, the caveat is that um, this statement method we're using detects a shift in uh, a significant shift in the distribution of association statistics for these genes. And so it's not necessarily detecting adaptation. It's just saying these genes are behaving abnormally and non-randomly. And that, that's probably due to adaptation, but um, not necessarily. And so it's saying, you know, in this case, all these genes are, have p-values that are much more shifted than you expect by chance. Um, but it's, it's hard to actually decouple which ones are adapted and which ones are just kind of uh, a little bit different. So we're still, uh, as I said, this is all really early days, but um, you know, we're, we're seeing this other group here that's driven, these are driven by things like Arabidopsis, Helianthus, Amaranthus, Populus, a grass, uh, eucalypt. So just to show you that these are very much defining uh, phylogenetic convergence. We're seeing things from all over the phylogeny contribute to these uh, signatures which I think is really interesting. So um, early stages, uh, this might all change a little bit if we find another bug, um, but uh, we're trying to get at how much repeatability there is in this kind of big genome-wide way across as many species as we can. 
And so uh, we will continue to, to add on new species. So if you, if you know people that have species that would be suitable, please get in touch. Um, you know, we want to ask these kind of questions eventually. And so uh, hopefully we'll have some more better answers to them soon. So I'm going to breeze quickly because we're getting closer to the end. I'm going to go a little bit faster through this last one on um, local adaptation and genome evolution in sticklebacks. Um, this is motivated by some theory I worked on a while ago where I was just looking at, you know, if you have a, a chromosome and, and a coding locus that, that is able to move by a small rearrangement from one place in the genome to another, then uh, under these kind of simulation models, you can get a, a concentrated genetic architecture where there's a high clustering to evolve uh, just because rearrangements can reshape the genome. And so uh, when you've got a homogeneous environment where there's no migration selection balance, the, you don't get any kind of reshaping of the genome, but where there's this migration selection balance or adaptation thing, then uh, you would predict that small rearrangements might be favored because they allow you to get, yield this clustered architecture that's more fit. And so I was curious at testing whether this happens in nature and three spine stick, stickleback seemed like a great place to test it because there's these known uh, clusters, genomic islands and divergence, where big, uh, you know, big regions of the genome contribute to divergence between marine and freshwater populations of this fish. They also seem to be associated with QTLs uh, for body shape and armor and all sorts of things. And this, this has been found in multiple, uh, multiple uh, studies over time. So we've got lots of wealth of evidence showing these things matter. So I was interested in asking, you know, we a priori know that these chromosomes 4, 7, and 21 seem to be particularly important for marine freshwater divergence. So we set those as our target chromosomes of interest beforehand for starting the study and just ask if rearrangements might have been important for building these clusters of loci. Um, to do this, uh, working with Kyushu Lee on uh, assembling a new genome of tube snout, which is the first fish outside of the stickleback clade. Um, there's been a few species of uh, genome assemblies within sticklebacks. And we got this outgroup so that we could use it to compare how uh, genome evolution has worked in the sticklebacks. And we, this allowed us to reconstruct where uh, macro rearrangements had happened. And interestingly, we found uh, fusions in chromosomes four and seven that were known to have happened before. We identified a new set of complex rearrangements in chromosome 21 at one end of the chromosome and then a, a translocation in, in uh, chromosome one. And all the other chromosomes were fully syntactic along the macro scale. And so it was neat, it showed us that, that large scale rearrangements were strongly associated with the uh, chromosomes that seemed to be involved in local adaptation. So four, seven, and 21 were our a priori chromosomes, and they were also ones that had all involved uh, macro rearrangements. And interestingly, uh, there's been a fusion to create chromosome four in, in two different lineages of stickleback. So the same, parent chromosomes fused together to create a chromosome four independently in Pangidius and Gasterosteus, which I think is an incredibly remarkable thing. And you can tell it's the, the different ones because they're actually in different orientations, um, but they, they brought the same macro stuff together. So it suggests that this, these, these linkage relationships are important at the macro scale. And then we wanted to look at micro rearrangements, reconstructing them by comparing the genomes. I won't go into that. Um, what we looked at was uh, data from a recent paper by King and al. showed uh, a whole bunch of lines of evidence to say, you know, these are the regions of the genome that are genomic islands of adaptation. And we wanted to ask whether uh, rearrangements are, tend to be enriched within these genomic islands. And so we just did, a, we, we counted up the number of rearrangements. Uh, rearrangements are here in blue. Uh, duplications of genes. So rearrangement is like a cut and paste, duplication is a copy paste. And then LSGs are lineage specific genes. So they're genes we couldn't find an ortholog to in any other species. And so genome-wide, we found that um, the, the genomic islands were tended to be enriched for these uh, duplications and rearrangements. Um, I'm just gonna quickly breeze through this. We, these are chromosomes four, seven, and 21. You can see the, uh, there's lines of evidence kind of on the top here, but basically there, there are lots of genomic islands within these chromosomes 4, 7, and 21 that show significant enrichment for, uh, in this case, the rearrangements, lineage-specific genes, and duplications. 
anytime there's a purple number on one of these uh, areas here, that's showing that that's a region that has more an enrichment of these events more than you expect by chance. And uh, another interesting overlap, we found that uh, looking at another data set for differential gene expression, so genes that were up or down regulated in freshwater versus marine conditions, or sorry, freshwater versus marine uh, backgrounds, so genetic backgrounds, if they were adapted to one or the other, they changed their gene expression. Those genes were also much more likely to be involved in gene duplications uh, or somewhat more likely to be involved in rearrangements, uh, which I thought was really interesting. So um, I breezed through this. I hope you can get a feeling for the, the general broad brush strokes. I think it's neat that it shows that there seems to be an involvement of reshaping the genome along with local adaptation to marine freshwater and sticklebacks. Um, it's, I, I'm always quite hedgy with these results. I think they're quite provocative, but um, it's not experimental. And by the nature of it, retrospective, uh, it, it's, it's just not super satisfying to someone like me. I find it really uh, like, oh yeah, it's consistent, but it could have just happened much less, I guess. So I don't know. It, I'd be curious to, to think from you how provocative you think that is or how, how random it is. Um, but I think it's neat that we, we, we do, we are seeing lots of, of enrichment with uh, duplications and rearrangements within these regions of the genome. And um, there does also seem to be an overlap with differential expression. And, and again, tying this back to flexibility, it, it may be that rearrangements give you another way to be flexible. Uh, you know, if you don't have a highly redundant genome, maybe if you move genes around, you can get a better architecture that way. So, um, Broad brushstroke uh, predictions that I might make about repeatability uh, to wrap this up. Um, you know, I think we, we, we see cases of large effect alleles uh, contributing to adaptation. So we know that they, they matter sometimes. And I think uh, my, I broadly predict that we're going to see a lot of variation in repeatability depending on the trait type we look at. I'm certainly not the first person to say something like that. And I think people have talked a lot about um, <clears throat> things, traits like coloration or ornamentation having a tendency to be quite a simple genetic basis and, and therefore be much more repeatable. Uh, complex traits like body size may be much more redundant and, and low repeatability. Uh, I think what we might often see is this kind of uh, some repeatability for a given trait, uh, you know, really important genes that you really have to change to get a new phenotype and then some non-repeatability just due to other stuff that could still contribute to variation but maybe not be quite as important. So um, I think that's all I'm going to say for now. Uh, a lot of people help me with this work. Um, and if there's a review I wrote recently on this that, that goes into a lot of the ideas I talked about here. Um, so I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Yes. because I don't know if people could hear the question. Not really. No, no, no. It's important to repeat it, please. So briefly paraphrasing that the question was, uh, we know about adaptive variation a little bit, um, but there can also be a lot of repeatability or non-repeatability at the phenotypic level. And uh, what do I think about that? Is that paraphrasing? Do we know anything about it? Yeah, do we know anything about it? Um, I, I, I think that uh, people that have looked at GWAS data would uh, Generally, GWAS data seems to be lower repeatability than uh, adaptation data, but uh, I'm saying that off the cuff and, and I'm not sure for sure. Um, but I actually just hired somebody recently to, to look at exactly that and basically try to re reproduce our, the same approach uh, with the Genotype Environment Associations looking more at GWAS data. Um, Yeah. If you would try instead of that image, 
Um, well, so the, the phenotypes here are complicated because they're locally adapted phenotypes also. So they're uh, the phenotypes. So, so, so say that we're two different environments, I, I, in both different environments, I need to grow a Yeah. What I do is I do this in this. Yeah. So choose a path by plotting your genetic yeah, uh, yeah, and, and so we can, we've looked at repeatability on all the phenotypes and environments. I didn't, it, it's, there, there's a hundred and some of them, so I didn't, I didn't show them here, but they're in the, the paper. Um, the repeatability of the phenotypic variation tends to be high, but not, uh, like some of the phenotypes are higher than uh, environments, others are not. It, it's difficult to compare them because they're not really apples to apples. Um, we like the methods we used uh, are not apples to apples. We use a different method for the environments and the phenotypes, um, and that I can tell you all about it. But that would take me a lot longer. Uh, we have thirty minutes. Yes, yeah. good. Sure <laughs> that, that's a great question. I, I think it's really that, that's. Um, I think that's a huge. Uh, that, that's actually the way to answer all this stuff is to compare the repeatability for standing variation or de novo mutation with the repeatability for adaptation. So that's. Yeah. Uh, maybe not start. So, I want to know. Um, so, um, I have to choose one, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, related to your uh, original, what you said originally, I'm, I'm not sure if whether you did answer the question. So, do we now know? Whether most of the constraint comes from uh, from selection or from development? And no, do we know which, which is I, I don't think we know at all yet. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So the the question was uh, going back to the a slide I had at the very beginning that was relating. You know, is it, are there selective constraints or developmental constraints? Do we know which of those matters, and can we use this information to get at that? Right? Is that the question? Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, certainly haven't answered that yet. Uh, I think that by getting at um, the comparisons of, say, standing genetic variation or de novo, what I'd love to do would be to do a mutation accumulation experiment, uh, do multiple QTL crosses, and find all the repeatability of de novo mutation from one species and then another and another. But that's probably the biggest, hardest thing to do ever, because um, that's it, de no, mutation accumulation is hard, and then QTL mapping. With on so many different lines would be impossible, and I mean, it's just messy. So standing variation is hard because it's some of standing variation is adaptive variation. And I, I'd like to do it with de novo mutation and do GWAS on de novo mutation that hasn't gone through the lens of selection, because once you look at phenotypes, um, that standing variation for phenotypes, some of that, if there's local adaptation, is also adaptive variation because migration selection balance brings in alleles that are adapted to a different environment and then are now present in this one. And so I think by comparing uh, the repeatability of new mutations with the repeatability of adaptation, then you can actually get at that because you can ask, um, you know, if we're seeing, uh, you know, the extent to which we're seeing repeatability at those different scales, you know, if the, if the amount of repeatability is the same, then that implies that, that the constraints are coming from the, uh, you know, there's just not that many ways to make a phenotype. If the amount of repeatability is much lower for the uh, new mutations than it is for the adaptation, then it implies there's lots of selective constraints. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. More questions here in the room? Uh, okay, so yes. <laughs> well, you are asking uh, very interesting about um, the repeatability of the snake and the adaptation. And I was wondering to what extent you know that even across populations of the same species, there is repeatability. Yeah, so that's um, that we've studied much more, and and it tends to be much higher uh, because uh, there's shared standing variation. And so the, the chance of a new mutation rising to fixation or to establishment from uh, a new mutation. If they if they do, right? if they feel like very far apart. Yeah, but if if they even if they have shared standing variation from ancestral. You know, if they if they diverged a few hundred thousand years ago, but they've got a large enough effective population size, conceivably there's still incomplete lineage sorting, shared standing variation. If the mutations at a frequency of even uh, five percent, 
it's got a very small, you know, let's say it was neutral and now there's an environmental change that makes that mutation beneficial. It'll have almost a 100% chance of fixing in those two populations. I think remember data from like old school PCL maximum personal numbers in different places and people were not finding it. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think that a, a massive revisiting of all this data is, is the way to, to get at this. But, um, you know, I, I think that, um, yeah, I, I repeat certainly like, so there's a nice paper by, uh, by Galena Bohotinska recently in, uh, on looking at uh, brassicas, and she showed that, that the species that were close in the phylogeny had much higher repeatability because of shared standing variation specifically and, and introgression and stuff like that. And so um, I'm, what I'm hoping to do generally with this stuff is actually preclude that because I find that um, not uninteresting, but it's uninformative to this question because what you want is you want the new mutations, you know, the, like how many new mutations could potentially contribute across the genome, not be dealing with the contingency of, oh, these ones just happen to have this shared standing variation. So obviously that's what can contribute, right? So I think um, interesting for different questions, but less useful for this question. Okay, so uh, yes. Yes, I was just going to ask if there's questions from. Uh, people remotely before we have another question here in the room. Yeah, yes, I need to ask if anyone from home wants to ask some questions. Let's see. Okay, so if not, then we have another question here in the room. Okay, and we give you some more time for to think about the question you want to ask. Yes, okay. Oh, thank, thank, thank you. And uh, and at the beginning of your talk, you seem to describe a kind of a polygonal uh, type of model that you have a small number of genes that uh, are responsible for a trait. But uh, in, in some of our examples, you tend to describe a, a, a kind of high redundancy on the genetic model. So, so can you elaborate a little bit on that? So where do you stand? Um, well, so I think where I stand is that, that different different traits will will vary along that spectrum. And I think that if you have a trait that is, um, I mean, for example, uh, I worked a little bit on opium poppy with a collaborator, and there conceivably, you know, the production of morphine within opium poppy is probably there for defense purposes. And, uh, you know, there's not very many loci in the genome that could conceivably contribute to morphine production. You have to be within the, the alkaloid biosynthetic pathway in order to do that. Probably tons of loci in the genome can overall improve the fitness of the plant and allow the plant to invest more resources in making morphine. So, you know, I think that there's, uh, a, 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 you know, the, the omnigenic model from, from uh, the Pritchard group, you know, I think it's, uh, it, I'm not sure that, it, maps nicely all the time, but the, I think the core versus peripheral uh, genes idea is one that people have thrown around before, and I think that's a useful kind of designation where, you know, there's some, some genes affect the trait of interest, and other genes just affect your fitness or your overall goodness, and maybe allow you to, to more effectively show that true phenotype of, of say, producing morphine. So I, I, I'd say that's an example of a trait that's you know, highly, highly uh, specific in its genetic basis, um, but probably has influence from the rest of the genome. Uh, when you go to, in conifers, you know, height growth is, a, I think, a classic trait at the other end of the spectrum, where it's basically a phenotype that, that integrates across all the other phenotypes. You know, how well have you resisted cold? How well have you resisted pests? How well have you turned sunlight into growth? You know, it, all these different things get put into height growth. And so it's kind of like this meta trait it integrates over all, all sorts of other traits. And so I think like that might span a continuum where you, you know, the more organ systems or you know, more um, pathways you're integrating across in the trait that's under selection, then I might expect it to be more redundant and less repeatable as just a really uh, intuitive guess. Thank you. Okay, so are there questions remotely? No, so then we can, no. uh, can I can I ask? Oh, yes, a yes, yes. Professor Margarita, yes. Hello, so you hear me well? Yes, so, yes. Uh, 
So uh, this is a, a very quick question. So you addressed uh, uh, basically differences between species, uh, and I was wondering uh, how how much uh, can also be uh, important to analyze different populations from the same species because mm -hmm. many times they are they are also very uh, differentiated and so how about testing repeatability at that level yeah yeah so actually one of the I, i'm sorry if i didn't repeat it properly somebody asked a similar question here as well uh, I, didn't, I didn't hear very well sorry I'll, I'll answer it with a different answer this time <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I think repeatability among populations might be particularly interesting if you look at, say, the x-axis, or like the, your, your predictor, being uh, how closely related are those different populations. And if you have a, a bunch of pairs of populations, say, spanning in sticklebacks, marine freshwater environments, uh, you know, how much does it matter that they have a lot of gene flow between them or not? That might really affect the repeatability, you know, and so that's, this is, what yeah. I said before was that standing variation is critical. And I think that is uh, that's an important evolutionary thing is, you know, how much yeah. propensity is there for shared standing variation due to whatever, whether it's... Yeah, uh, well, uh, uh, as I studied the Drosophilus of school, I was thinking also about, for instance, rearrangements and the inversions. Sometimes they are very uh, contrasting the presence of inversions, for instance, in a, in a client. So they mm -hmm. can be the opposites, the, the extremes may be really... Uh, having a different dynamic. So, so it mm -hmm. might also be interesting to explore that. Yeah, I mean, I would imagine that repeatability would be particularly high for things like uh, large effect loci, like, like, a, like a rearrangement. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so one more question. Ah, okay, so two more questions. So, yes, <laughs> not, not too sorry. <laughs> Um, I, so, yeah, so the question is about invasive species and if those can be useful to understand this. Thank you. I, get, I get excited about answering, so I forget to repeat. Um, yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, I haven't, we've, we've specifically excluded them from this, this one because, because of the recency and uh, all sorts of other potential compound, you know, the species that are able to adapt and, and invade might not be a random subset of species. The ones we've got are so awesome, a random subset of species. But um, I think it, invasion is a really cool thing. And I think uh, because it's a rapid adaptation thing, uh, I think it's a really neat, uh, slightly different one. I'd love to see someone contrast uh, invasion with uh, artificial selection, you know, and, and see, uh, you know, if we look at, at uh, breeding for agriculture and contrast the repeatability of, of artificial selection on short time scales with, say, the repeatability of natural adaptation in an invasion species context. I think there's all sorts of places that would be a good, good spots to look at that. Um, and I've actually kind of vaguely thought about trying to organize a consortium of people to like each take, like somebody take invasive species and somebody take uh, artificial selection. So um, if you're interested in that, let me know and maybe we'll organize a workshop. Okay, so last question from the group. Is it possible because you like we take on the sunflower and the humans are like yeah. I'm sure that plasticity matters. Uh, we, we have no capacity to get at that here. So everything was all the phenotypes were just planted in the cotton garden. And so we didn't have any idea about, about genotype environment interactions for, for, for phenotype, like for plasticity. Um, but I, I would imagine it matters a lot. Um, it's just a level of complexity. We can't imagine. <laughs> okay. Thank you. thank you very much, everyone. And let's thank Sam again. Thank you. Looking forward to seeing you guys.
Obrigado, Patrícia. Vitor, vou parar então. Obrigada também.